This is episode 70 of the Fitness and Post podcast. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit fitnessandpost.com slash 70. I have also created a bonus document to accompany this episode titled How to Set Up a More Ergonomic and Dynamic Workstation that outlines in more detail a lot of the concepts that Josh and I talk about in this episode. You can download your free bonus document at fitnessandpost.com slash 70 download. And if you would like to learn more about Focal Upright and the products that they offer, visit the special link that we set up for this episode, fitnessandpost.com slash focal. That's fitnessandpost.com slash F-O-C-A-L. This episode is sponsored by editstock.com. EditStock provides high-quality, uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary, so you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. EditStock offers professional feedback on your work and even allows you to use your cuts for your demo reel. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit editstock.com today to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a film and television editor and the creator of Fitness and Post. I've spent many years working brutally long hours in a dark room and battled numerous health problems due to the sedentary nature of my career. And that's what led me to building Fitness and Post. Whether you work in post-production like me, or if you're a designer, programmer, animator, composer, or anyone working a sedentary job all day, we'll help you learn how to sit less, focus more, eat better, and bring health and wellness back into your life. You spend all day fixing it in post, now it's time for some fitness in post. Hello and welcome to the Fitness and Post podcast, where it is my mission to help you optimize the most powerful operating system that you have, yourself. Today's guest is Josh Kirst, the Executive Vice President and Principal Ergonomist at Focal Upright Furniture. To put it simply, Josh is an ergo geek. He is an experienced, passionate, and thoughtful leader in the field of ergonomics with an emphasis on designs that positively transform the way that people work in the digital age. He holds a BSc from the University of Michigan, Go Blue, in industrial engineering, and he's a certified professional ergonomist, certified industrial ergonomist, and if that wasn't enough, he is also a member of the ANSI BIFMA X5.1 Office Seating Committee. Clearly, with a title that crazy complicated, this guy knows what he's talking about. Two very common questions that I get are, what is the best chair to buy for my workstation, and what is the best ergonomic setup? Josh and I answer both of these questions in detail today, as well as many other ergonomically related questions. But to warn you, the answers to these questions will surprise you, and you may not want to hear them. But before we get to the interview, I would like to let my listeners know about our Fitness and Post Amazon link, and I also want to thank my existing fans for using this link to make all of your Amazon purchases. You are literally helping me keep the lights on for Fitness and Post, and I am eternally grateful for your support. So here's how it works. All you have to do is visit fitnessandpost.com slash Amazon. That's it. Super simple. This will redirect you to the Amazon homepage, and Amazon will then donate 5% of your purchase back to the Fitness and Post program, and you literally don't pay a cent. So if you enjoy this show and you hope to hear more episodes in the future, please write yourself a reminder to bookmark fitnessandpost.com slash Amazon as your new homepage and use it for all of your Amazon shopping. Thank you for your support. And now, without further ado, my conversation with ergonomist Josh Kirst. I'm here today with Josh Kirst, the executive vice president and principal ergonomist at Focal Upright Furniture, and more importantly, a fellow Wolverine. So welcome today, Josh. Hey, good morning, Zach. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. Now, listen, I am super, super excited about this conversation because in my mind, because I work in the film industry, I'm going to call this a sequel to the podcast that I did with Ben Greenfield about a month ago, and I'll put a link in the show notes to that, 
where Ben and I talk about what's actually happening to the body when you are sedentary, not just sitting, but when you're sedentary all day long, how standing really isn't the be all, end all answer, and how even exercise isn't going to help you just exercise away all the negative effects of being sedentary. But today, you and I are gonna take this conversation to the next level because we are gonna talk about what is actually happening and just kind of the idea behind the fact that there isn't the perfect chair, there isn't the perfect ergonomic position. And I heard a conversation that you had with Ben that really kind of inspired me to, to dig into this even deeper. And this is a topic I've become very, very passionate about. So very, very glad to have you on the show today. And we're just literally gonna dive right in and geek out like madmen on this for the next hour. Perfect, I'm an ergo geek. I'm ready. I'm ready. Awesome. Okay. So, so that being the case, before we jump in and get started, I want people to understand a little bit about your journey, what your background is. I know that you have a, a background in industrial engineering. So just explain what you do for Focal Upright, but also a broader sense of your expertise. Yeah. So I think when people hear the word ergonomics, they often think, oh, that, that must be a, a new chair or something, or maybe it's a, a new keyboard or tool or device, you know, and, and I actually am an industrial engineer. In, in the 80s, I actually worked and graduated from the University of Michigan, spent a couple of years in research there. But I, I spent about two and a half decades as an ergo consultant and really more, much more than just chairs and keyboards. It's really finding ways to help optimize how people work, right? And and that, that actually got me an opportunity to work in, uh, in your world a little bit through uh, control rooms and Saturday Night Live and you know, set design and, and moving sets at soap operas and actually a chance to work helping with some uh, some wardrobe issues on rake stages at The Wiz <laughs> on Broadway. Uh, so it's much more than just a chair. Actually, my experience is kind of unique in that I actually was part of, uh, in the late 90s, uh, design for a, a new seat and and actually was looking at that and was trying to get people to uh, what we had thought uh, really was the goal back then of getting people more comfortable. But you know what? The end result was people became much more sedentary. And as a result, I ended up changing my profession, or at least my, my position, and moving towards focal upright as a designer and gonomist to uh, change the way that people work. So getting people upright, more active, a more healthy and, and more mindful uh, experience for people. And uh, you know, it was really important, and I'm excited about talking about that today. So what was that event, that, that thing that made you say, you know what, I think that I need to make a change and I think I might be going down a path that doesn't make sense? Yeah, so the epiphany happened. So I'm on this uh, committee, it's called BIFMA. It's really just a furniture manufacturers association where we're talking about the new standards and getting people all chairs with armrests that go up and down and in and out and seat pans that go forward and back. And, you know, we sort of gone down that path and I... I just uh, spent uh, the weekend with some of my nieces and nephews and watched a uh, a movie called Wally. -E. And it, I don't know if you recall this animated movie, but you know the humans there are really driven by doing as little as humanly possible. Technology surrounds them. They these people became overweight. They're literally laying down in their chairs with screens wrapped around them. I looked around the room and I I realized that I was living in a world of ergo zombies, you know, just like the movie. And I sort of whacked myself in the head, one of those square shoulders, flat forehead moments. Like, square, how is this happening? I whacked myself in the head and said, oh my gosh, we're, we're becoming those people. And so, you know, I spent the first 25 years trying to get people more and more comfortable ergonomics 1.0. I think for the next 25 years, I'm going to try ergonomics 2.0, which is just like the movie, the saving grace in that movie was that the humans got up and they, they freed themselves from that vicious circle. And, and that's kind of where my mission has led me to uh, focal, focal upright. It's actually in our, uh, our, our company's name. And, and it's really our, our bodies are designed to move and and we're going to design products and environments that support that. Well, and I, it's funny that you brought up Wally because they're, I'm assuming you're familiar with a product called the Altwork. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, and I, I do not want to speak poorly about anybody. I'm sure that these are people that have the best of intentions and they've worked for years and years to build an amazing product. But this is essentially the movie Wally coming to life where it is this 
desk that will adjust from sitting to standing to now laying down. And it's all in this like really cool contraption. And I've had several people that have sent links to this to me and saying, what do you think? Like, is is this going to be a, a better ergonomic desk? And is this better than standing? And I'm like, oh, for the love of God, this is the worst thing that can happen to us because it's going to make us even more sedentary. And it's going to exacerbate this problem times 10 because you're never going to have to get up or down. So it, it really is kind of getting to the point where if we continue to go down this road, Wally is no longer going to be just a movie. It's going to be our reality. And in my mind, that's quite terrifying. Well, I'll go one step farther. I was actually becoming those characters. So as a guy who is physically fit, and I'd spent some time uh, in my career being uh, an advocate of exercise, and I was a competitive sailor, I had found myself at the highest weight, and I had some work over in the Middle East I had to do. So I actually had to go get some new uh, suits. And and they said, a 39-inch waist? Oh, my gosh. So you know, this epiphany was not only, uh, it hit home. And so, you know, the the change that's happened for me is something uh, short of miraculous. And I just want to make sure that other people get to share in what I've I've experienced. Well, and as long as you brought up Wally, I wasn't really quite planning on going down this specific train of thought. But in in the previous show, I talked about with Ben, some of the, the basic things that are happening from a metabolic standpoint, type two diabetes, increased risk of breast and colon cancer, stuff like that. But I didn't really go down the route of what's happening to your body if you're not experiencing gravity, the way that your body has evolved and been designed to experience it. So let's talk a little bit about that route of if we're saying Wally is the end goal and we're thinking, oh, that's crazy. That's never going to happen. But what's actually happening to the body when you don't experience gravity properly and you're sedentary all day? Yep. So, you know, obviously our bodies are designed to move. And so we, you know, we experience movement, our, our muscles contract and, and, you know, they lengthen and shorten and, you know, we get all this wonderful oxygenated blood flow and, and these things that happen. When we are positioned or inactive, right? So, you know, I know and actually had some chance to talk to some of the folks at, at NASA recently. And, you know, there are things that happen to an astronaut's body. So we shorten, you know, our bones start to actually degrade and, and you know, we don't get the same nutrient uh, level and, and oxygenated blood flow that really uh, we need. In fact, they have to exercise more just to combat sort of that lack of gravity that is always there for us. So, you know, there are different types of activity that people perform. And one of the most important ones is called NEAT. And that's just an acronym. It's a NEAT acronym. It stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And so that's, I like the non-exercise part, right? It's basically low activity. It's not, you know, on a treadmill and or, you know, doing this heavy sweating activity. It's sort of this low fidgeting movement. And and you know, it turns out that this neat activity, it's kind of like the tortoise and the hare, a little bit over a long time is way better than trying to do a, a you know, sort of a, a blast level of, of energy expenditure. And so this neat movement is really good. And it turns out it's really helpful for people to process metabolically the fat that's in their body. There's the activation of all these wonderful enzymes. And there's some really cool things that happen. And when you're up and about, uh, you have a tendency to do more of this neat activity. And uh, when you're sedentary, it, it goes pretty much to zero. Now, I'm, it's funny that you brought up NASA because literally right now I'm just finishing up Joan Vernicos's book, Sitting Kills, Moving Heels. I'm assuming you're it's oh, I know kills. Joan. Yep. She okay. and I spent uh, about a year ago at a, a conference. So she's she's an interesting person. Uh, <laughs> she's sort of the Dr. Ruth of ergonomics, I think. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's really funny that uh, that you brought that up because that's something I'm learning about right now, which is how gravity actually affects our bodies. And I'm glad you brought up exercise because they found that with the tippest, toppest, best athletes on the planet, which are astronauts, they would go into space and because they didn't have gravity, they would their bodies would literally just start wasting away over a very short period of time. And the thing that really struck me, because that 
didn't seem counterintuitive. It seemed like, oh yeah, well that, that kind of makes sense. I wouldn't have thought about it. But even if they were exercising every single day, all of the same things were still happening to them because they didn't experience gravity. And that was that really big moment for me, like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. So there, there was a, a passage the, that she had in there that was talking about the stimuli that your body experiences just when you do something as simple as standing up, and this was another one of those key moments for me. So can you talk a little bit about the idea of, of like one of the examples that she gives where you can either stand once for 30 minutes or you can stand up 15 times every two minutes over half an hour and how that actually makes a big difference in the way that your body just experiences movement. Yep. So that's a really important point. In fact, astronauts take uh, several days to actually get back to acclimate to their uh, to this sort of situation here on our uh, on our planet. And it's interesting what's going to happen with these manned missions to Mars and all those things. But, you know, I think that if there's only one thing the, the listeners should take away from this podcast, let it be the following. The single best ergonomic posture, the absolute best one is always your next one. And so that means this idea of transitions and changing it up. And, you know, we see this happening in various means, whether it's CrossFit, training, uh, or, or any of these sort of multidisciplinary approaches. Our body really responds well to these transitions. In fact, last week I was at Texas A&M University working uh, on some, uh, at least peering into some of the research that's being done by one of the leaders in the field, Dr. Mark Benden. And we had a discussion about about transitions and how we might actually get people through the use of the internet of things or whether it's something called intelligent interruptions where we might actually monitor how people are feeling through maybe even something simple as a Fitbit or a video camera to monitor those signals and help encourage people to move more. Because it's really important to change your posture, right? The, this idea of transitions, and we don't know the exact number. I know this summer, uh, last summer in Europe, they sort of set this guideline that every 30 minutes, we should try and at least do two minutes of movement at a bare minimum. Actually, it's a minute and 40 seconds. I like to have the 10 and 2 rule. <laughs> After 10 minutes in a specific posture, I like to spend two minutes in an alternative. And when, you know, I actually am conducting this podcast today through a combination of leaning on one of my devices that we have. And, and then I stand and actually my standing position actually uses a foot rail and I do something called the uh, Captain Morgan's posture. It's merely putting my foot on that foot rail and, and uh, giving my hip flexors a little bit more uh, relief from, uh, from being standing too, too erect. So there are a number of different aspects that happen, but this key is these transitions. Well, so based on what you said then about the idea of the best ergonomic position being your next one, I'm really, really glad that you said this because I think probably if it's not the top question, it's one of the top three questions that I'll see either via email or Facebook or social media is people saying, I'm in the market to invest some real money in the best chair that I can find. So what do you recommend as the best ergonomic chair? And I will pull my hair out when people ask this because the day will come in my lifetime where people realize that that's not the question to ask. So what is the correct question to ask and how would you answer that question? Well, I think the, the bigger question is, what do I want to achieve, right? What what kind of tasks am I going to perform? Today's uh, workplace, whether it's in an editing room or an office or, you know, in an industrial manufacturing setting, is really about options, options for the way I want to work. If it's collaborative, you know, the, a chair might not be the best method for me to collaborate or, or accidentally collide to bounce some ideas off a colleague. It might happen through... Uh, a vertical or a high pitch uh, table that you know I can just you know stand up at at the coffee bar and if I am doing some heads down work you know and I really got to nail get this stuff out the door um, it turns out that you know when we sit in a chair our hip flexors go to about ninety degrees our our body naturally and effectively. Uh, 
produces this kyphosis or think about it like tech's neck or, you know, ET craning his head forward, looking at the screen, which puts our back in these really nasty postures. In terms of blood flow also, we, we understand today, and a lot of this research, uh, Zach, has come out in the last five or eight years in, in terms of what happens uh, to oxygenated blood flow and, and these negative aspects. There's you know, there's a number of different things that we see, but one of the things is if I do want a chair, I want something that moves with me. It's dynamic, right? And so this is the whole idea of active or dynamic seating. And the best chair might actually be one that allows me to adopt multiple positions. You know, we're big advocates of what we'll call a stand assist. You know, sit to stand desks have been really, really popular in the last couple of years. People ask what chair I should pair with that. And the answer might be, you know, something that I can lean against or actually lean like I would consider it the same thing if you went to a party and, you know, you went to everyone typically congregates in the kitchen and they end up leaning their backside against the kitchen counter. Well, you know, these designs are stand assists are really to promote that sort of upright position. And so when I look for a chair, I, I look for the task that people are performing and, and really a good designer, a good interior designer has to be almost like a good uh, village planner or zoner, zoning uh, planner and uh, accommodating the different types of work that people perform. So, you know, it's not that I'm anti-chair. It's just uh, I think it might be the wrong tool for the task. Well, and I'm glad that you brought up the, the sit-stand assist and leaning on something because that was actually my entry point into the focal upright world is learning about the MOGO from Ben Greenfield, I guess it would have been it was over a year ago now. It was one or two years ago. Um, but I literally will not go anywhere without the MOGO. And people are thinking, what in the world is a MOGO? So explain a little bit about what the MOGO is, and then we can go a little bit more into some of the other things that Focal Operate offers as well. Yep. So it's it's a brand new design form factor. It really is a category of seating we'll call a stand assist, or it allows you to perch your Really, it's a portable seat. It, uh, it weighs about uh, two pounds. I carry mine in my backpack as I travel around the world. And, you know, it, you can use it and it telescopes out and use it as just a, uh, a backside support. You know, it has a really cool little super grippy base on it. My partner is Martin Keen, who of Keen Footwear. You might, some of your listeners may know of Keen Footwear. Uh, and I just tell people these are just Keens for your ass. <laughs> They're really nice and comfortable. It's a nice way to uh, give yourself an open hip position. Uh, your shoulders go back. It's almost, uh, it's very difficult to slouch. You you sort of adopt the shoulders behind the hips or of these, uh, it's a grateful dead bear, you know, leaning back position, which opens up your uh, your hips. It also uh, generates a lot less uh, back compressive force and takes, you know, 40 to 50% of the weight off your feet. It's not the only seat in this category. I am still part of that BIFMA group, the Business Industry Furniture Manufacturers Association. And in fact, two years ago, there were only a handful of entries in this category of dynamic or active seating for perching. And today, Today, uh, there are probably over 50. So it's really the fastest growing type of design form factor. It allows people to work at a standing environment. You can use it at work. You can use it at play. People can use it out on the golf course, listening to a jazz concert. You can just telescope it out, put it out, and it's got a nice little spike that can go into the grass. Or, you know, on the other side, you can flip it around. It has a nice little super uh, grippy ball that uh, lets you do, uh, do your work at a standing desk and and really benefit from all the benefits of standing without the fatigue and, and discomfort that inevitably comes with staying in one posture for too long, Zach. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes if people want to learn more about the MOGO and they want to purchase it, and I highly recommend it. Like I said, it's, I do the same thing while I'll have it in my backpack, and I'll, if I'm working from home, I'll be using it at home. If I'm at the office, I'll have it there. I've traveled with it before. Like I, I, I did a, a talk about Fitness and Post about a year ago and flew to Florida, and it was an overnight 
my trip, one of the only things that I packed with me was the MoGo so I could have it in and I could also demonstrate it as well and show how easy it was. What the MoGo really did for me is help me break through the idea that I either have to have a standing workstation or I have to have a sitting workstation. Because a very common question that I get from people is, well, I've been inspired to stand more, but my office is not going to buy me a standing desk. So what do I do? So if somebody came to you and said, I really want to try to make the transition, but I'm not going to make the investment yet. And I just want to try it out. I've now found there's this middle ground where thanks to the MoGo and other things, you can make the transition. So what would you say to somebody if they were like, I want to make the transition, but I'm not ready to invest and I don't have a standing workstation yet? Yeah. So, you know, I consider myself a fairly uh, thrifty individual, (laughs) probably on my cardboard tombstone. It's going to say here in lies a pretty thrifty guy. Uh, I have uh, some some experience along this and I would give people the the advice of trying, trying. Listen, if you're traveling, every hotel room has a standing desk. I bet you didn't realize it, but they do. It's called an ironing board. So if you just pull out an ironing board, put your laptop on the ironing board and position yourself in front of it, you can feel what a standing desk or you can do the same at your kitchen counter. The idea of the MoGo is really just a device that you can lean against to create sort of this active posture. I find myself rocking back and forth. We kind of coined the term uh, rock in your day job, but it's really that neat, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis happening. And so, you know, you can try it, you know, it, it's a it's a simple and easy way. I've seen people hack their own workstations from books or Amazon Prime boxes back to back on, on you know, cha- repurposed high back chairs, uh, you know, I've seen uh, milk crates being used, you know, obviously in a, in a professional environment, you know, and, and it'd be interesting to see what kind of uh, hacks your listeners have tried. I, I think that's probably, the, I'm always inspired by the creativity of people to sort of solve this problem on their own. But, uh, you know, that is really, if you really want to simulate it, just take a high uh, bar stool and lean your backside up against the edge. I think if you walk around most offices, you'll find most people are not sitting all the way in the back on their chairs. Many of them are perched forward. And that's all we're trying to do is have uh, form follow function. And what other options are there that Focal has? And I want to make my listeners very, very clear that I'm not trying to create an advertisement for one specific company or sell anything, but you guys really have a lot of amazing products that I wasn't even aware of a year or two ago that go far beyond we have sit-to-stand desks, like all these different things. So what are some of the other kind of transitional things that if somebody said, I'm kind of ready to jump in, but geez, $700 for a stand-up desk, I don't know if I'm there yet. Yeah, so I mean, uh, our our products range and everything, you can, you can get started for under 100 bucks, right? So it's pretty simple. The MoGo is uh, is super affordable. We've had them used in, in professional offices. They were on the golf course at the Masters this last year. They were at, uh, I was in Austin last week and I saw people in line waiting for Austin City Limits, the ACL, using them. Uh, so that's pretty cool, right? It's nice to see your product out there. There, there are products, you know, that we have that are under, you know, 300 bucks that, you know, with a nice little foot rail, something we call the pivot, which is really cool allows you to adopt either, you know, sort of a seated, it's not, you know, it's not the ideal position, but also a uh, leaning position, which is much better, that allows you to transition between those two. And all the way up to, you know, uh, devices you can pair around. I think our most popular right now uh, for the community is is really this idea of a standing conference room table. We had them at uh, companies like Google, and we've got them at, at, you know, manufacturing settings like BMW, where people find the meetings are just happening quicker. People are shoulder to shoulder. They're they're getting stuff done. They're more energized. They're uh, they're able to tap into that potential that always exists in our bodies, but yet somehow seems elusive to find. Uh, you know, what athletes call the zone or, or, or flow. And uh, so, you know, we do make a range of standing desks. Uh, unique about Focal is that we uh, believe in a um, process that is called lean to stand. So uh, we're trying to stay true to our name, Focal Upright, and, and keeping people and giving them an option uh, 
So if, it, if people are interested in trying some of those things, you can check us out. But I think there are lots of companies that are out there. As I said, it's exploding in the last two years. And I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of being more in the zone and being more creative because that's where I wanted to go to next is really explaining to people why it's so important beyond the negative consequences that you get if you're going to sit for 12 to 16 hours a day. Because I always think it's it's so funny when I read all these sitting as a new smoking articles and they say sitting for six to eight hours a day. And I'm like, seriously, six to eight hours? Like that's a half day in our industry. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting 12 to 16 hours a day. And again, in that podcast with Ben, we talk about a lot of the negative consequences of all of that. But I would love to go further into the positive consequences of doing more of these transitions, of moving more, of standing more, especially to the creativity and to the brain. So what's physiologically happening and allowing you to get in the zone and be more productive and have these better meetings? Yeah, so I, I think, first of all, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, a lot of people are in the blame game, right? And first of all, it's not our fault, right? It's not your fault, right? The idea that chair has been this ancient leisure tool has been misapplied to technological advances, you know? You know, I even look at the words like, uh, you know, the term chairman, right? Or these were, these. this tool was designed for leisure and not really for, you know, being so predominant in our world. But, you know, we've gone down this road of comfort, you know, almost to the point, as I said, of Wally. -E, and uh, the trend probably is is swinging a little bit the other way now, at least with some of the folks who are able to tap into, I, I, I say it's like getting your mojo back. So what happens? So most importantly, tend to, so again, last week I was at Texas A&M and there's this uh, professor down there who's in the field of neuroergonomics. You think I'm a geek? Well, Dr. Ranja Mehta is, she is the uber geek of, you know, the next cutting edge of ergonomics 2.0. And what she's being able to do is look at what happens to oxygenated blood flow to our brains and see what happens when we're sedentary and when we're uh, upright or more active. And the difference that she, she uses, you know, it's called infrared spec near spectroscopy. It's freaking lasers. They're shooting at these uh, grad students to look at what's happening in their brains. And, you know, it's amazing to see the difference. And so by tapping into that potential that exists, you know, that in, in our bodies, we're able to think on our feet. She's also finding some pretty cool things in terms of ability to not only get our mojo back, but combat things like depression and anxiety, which, you know, the opposite of those things, you know, are obviously being engaged and, and, and being, you know, positive about, uh, you know, each one of those collisions that we have with other people, you know. Nobody ever uh, scheduled a meeting to have a good idea. They usually happen by chance and circumstance. And so if we can get people upright and, and get them more engaged, whether it's through an upright conference table or at least just keeping a body in motion, it's a really good way to uh, to tap into that creative mojo. Yeah, and I think that going even one step further is not just the idea, of, oh, I'm going to have more oxygen going to my brain and I'm going to be a little bit more creative and I'm going to feel better. I think that there's actually a point at which people need to start understanding that you are actually going to be treated differently because of the posture that you maintain. Like you, you will become your chair or if you're standing up, people are going to look at you and treat you differently. So are you familiar with Amy Cuddy's TED Talk about this concept? Absolutely. Strike a pose, you know, definitely, you know, the having shoulders back and and, <laughs> and showing my front side, you know, that's really a part of that. That's actually, there's some good biomechanics behind that, uh, the natural lordosis. It's really cool. That whole idea is a, a part of being active. And, you know, one of the things that even goes beyond what Amy Cuddy was talking about, I would say that it, it goes to a body in motion tends to stay in motion. So we look at, you know, things like Newton's first law that would say, you know, as I'm moving, as I'm being able to project, I, I can almost fake it till I make it, you know, and that's uh, that posture you become um, more positive, your your shoulders go back, your your chest goes out, you know, actually placing your hand on your, your, your hip can actually help do that. Uh, I call it the Captain Morgan pose, uh, or, you know, it's actually putting your foot up on a foot rail. I'm doing it right now. 
now. And you can't help but feel just a rush of endorphins, you know, that happen. Uh, those receptors are, are definitely uh, there in our bodies, and it's part of our overall makeup. You know, humans were designed to move, and that's a part of it. And this is a big reason why the best, absolute best ergonomic position it's always your next one. Well, and to, and to go one step further, if you're a director or you're a producer, just put yourself in their, their shoes for a moment. If they walk into an editor's room and that editor is sitting slouched at their workstation with their back to the door in the back corner of the room, not maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, that director or producer is going to make certain inferences about that person and how they carry themselves and the position they're in, and they're going to treat them accordingly. But now imagine that a director or producer walks into a room and there's an editor that's standing in a position where he is facing the door, he is standing upright, and he is carrying himself with the proper posture, they're gonna treat that person with a different level of respect. And this is something that I have seen every day for years, and there is now scientific backing that's actually proving that if you maintain a certain position, like you can take a position where you're kind of slouched and looking down and not making eye contact, or you can do the extreme, and again, this, these are all things that, that Amy cut talks about and I'll link to her TED talk but you can put yourself in like you know the the hero position and people are literally going to treat you and see you differently because of that and that's the bigger picture with all, with all of this and I did a whole podcast about this concept um, called we are not below the line because in the the film industry editors have now kind of been relegated to the point of just really being you know just keyboard monkeys essentially and I really believe the part of that is because of the way that we we collectively treat ourselves and carry ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, I, I believe that editors are probably one of the most powerful, probably, but underrated positions in Hollywood. You have an important role. You know, I watch, I'm a big fan of uh, Empire. My son just loves Cookie. He just thinks that's the the, the, the end all be all person on, on television right now. But imagine if in, instead the artists that were performing behind, you know, and singing were all seated you know, what would that perception be like? Are they being most creative? But yet when we pan to the the editing or the the, the room where the folks are actually making uh, all that, that magic happen technologically, they we just see them seated, you know, and they're slumped over. I can tell you that your head weighs about as much as a bowling ball. I kind of sound like foghorn leghorn right there, but it's about 10 to 12 pounds, uh, some cases up to 13 pounds. And every inch we move it forward, you know, and that's slouching position places about 20 pounds on our back, additional force. So imagine what is actually happening, not only what I appear to be in that slouching position, but how I feel internally with an extra 100 or 200 pounds on my back. You know, I've got enough strain, I've got enough anxiety, I've got enough stress, I, I don't really need to add to that. So the whole idea of slouching and finding sort of a natural position, and that's been my experience, Zach. Right? So and I actually place my shoulders back, it's just a freeing and, and the ability to move and, and, and fidget. So I, I remember going to school and back in the grade school and I had this teacher, uh, Mrs. Chafee. She was like a six foot four Barbara Bush, <laughs> you know. She would say, everyone sit down and be quiet and quit fidgeting, Josh. Well, we've actually seen the uh, adaptation of standing desks and, and stand assist seating in the classroom and find engagement up, uh, kids actually being able to be weaned off some of their ADHD meds and scores going up, you know. So maybe, just maybe, with the help of editors and kids coming up through the classroom, we can change this paradigm. But, you know, we aren't to blame. It's not our fault. It's, it's just this ancient leisure tool that's been misapplied. <laughs> Well, I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of young kids in school because I think that there's this idea in people's minds that, well, I'm right out of college, I'm 24 years old, I go to the gym three times a week. Like, I'll worry about this stuff in like 15 or 20 years, but right now I'm just going to hunker down, I'm going to work my 16 hours a day, and I'm going to make my mark, and I'm going to build my demo reel. So explain how just because you exercise, you're young, maybe you're even eating kale salads at lunch – 
this just isn't going to counteract the effects of being sedentary all day long. Yeah, so um, Zach, I, I've coined this phrase uh, sort of the active couch potato. And, and so what happens to our bodies is we can't really hope to exercise our way out of long periods of sedentary um, activity or inactivity. What happens is, the, and I won't get too technical, you know, inside our body we have these, uh, these, these things that happen and, and when we are inactive, for example, our, our body doesn't have this little vacuum cleaner which cleans out fat, right? And it turns off various receptors and says, you know, I'm, I'm inactive, I'm going to shut down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually not process and, and metabolic function slows down. Bursts of exercise have proven in the last couple couple of years, this is actually the active couch potato syndrome, don't actually turn that switch back on. These receptors or these, these biological markers are, they're basically biased to inactivity and don't switch on with activity. Uh, and so instead of, and I'll go back to sort of this, uh, this tortoise and the hare, instead of being the hare of, you know, resting, 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 and doing this burst of activity a little bit over a long period of time, you know, is actually much better for our bodies. You know, with kids in particular, they want to be able to move. Uh, they want to fidget. They want to have and burn some of those extra calories. We're finding that attention is going up. Uh, and again, I'm going to point to Dr. Mark Benden down at Texas A&M and his Stand to Learn program is really cool. They've actually, for the first time, seen double-digit increases. He's tracked these kids through five years. Uh, double-digit increases in their PSAT scores, uh, which is the single largest increase in the state of Texas history. Um, and so they give us an opportunity to say, you know, with our office jobs or at least our editors, you know, hey, I'm getting my daily exercise, I'm eating right, but long periods of sitting down is basically storing up health issues. You know, we've actually seen, and you mentioned earlier about cancer, and, you know, there's actually this predominance of colon cancer, but actually lung cancer for people who have never smoked. You know, these are people who are eating kale in their lunch and they're doing all these wonderful things and they realize the unintended consequences on their body. The things they can't see are, are pretty significant. So just, and the good news is just a few simple changes, you know, whether it's getting up, uh, you know, a couple times an hour, uh, you know, one of, one of the best and easiest ways to, to experience some of these benefits is to take a walking meeting. And specifically after you eat, that first 30 minutes after you eat is like the important time frame to sort of get those, those markers moving and say, hey, this body's in motion. Um, and a simple, you know, 30 minute walk, uh, walking meetings between one and three people. We just did a nice little blog post on it this week at vocalupright.com, uh, talking about how that can really benefit your body and, and spark some creative and actually make, you know, what somewhat digitally anonymous and, you know, enjoy the outside air and, uh, and oxygen that's out there in the world. You know, as little as a 10 minute walk can change the serotonin levels in your body and make a positive influence. Yeah. And for, for my listeners, I'll put a link to uh, Wikipedia where it explains what the outside is and it even has pictures because <laughs> um, we, we, we don't see that too often in our industry, which actually will transition to the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is something I know that you're very familiar with, but might not sound intuitive to somebody that thinks about an ergonomist and, oh, well, I'm supposed to have this type of keyboard or this type of mouse is the idea of lighting and how if you work in an environment of darkness and perpetual darkness for the people in my my industry. How does that affect all of the things that we're talking about? And what are some ways to counteract that? Yeah. So um, the School of Public Health at Harvard did a recent uh, review of, of lighting and its effect on our bodies. So, you know, for a long period of time, you know, lighting was was really disregarded and just actually thought about in terms of only one measure, intensity, right? And I think the most important change is not just intensity, but the quality of light that people see. You know, in your environment, you know, obviously, and so probably my, my, my understanding of it in the film editing world is, is very dark, you know, it's a lot like a mushroom, maybe, you know, you're, you're actually in that environment for long periods of time, making these great, wonderful things but uh, it can actually, your eyes adapt and adopt that, that low light level. 
what we understand as we age, we need better and higher quality light. So for example, a 40 year old uh, might need 2X the amount of light to see something with uh, the same conspicuity or how conspicuous something is as a 20 year old. Unfortunately, when you get to be my age and, you know, you're an AARP card holder, uh, you need like four or five times the amount of light to be able to see the same thing. But it's not just the intensity, it's also this quality. And we're lucky that we live in the area that we do because there's a, a new measure for lighting and your listeners should look for this. It's called the CRI. It's called Color Rendering Index. And CRI, it's much more than just foot candles or lumens. It talks about the visible spectrum of light. You know, outside the CRI, outside you can look on Wikipedia and see what outside looks like, but it's actually 100. That's natural light. It has wonderful impact. There's vitamin D that we get from all these things. There's wonderful effect on our body. When we are in a dark environment, you know, we tend to not have that same, it's like, you know, a pitch black is a C, CRI of zero. Most of the lighting that we're suggesting for people to use as task lighting should have a CRI value of about 90 or above. And with LED lighting, that's why it's really cool right now, we're actually able to improve the the quality of the light. Uh, Back in the 80s, uh, a lot of the light, if you remember the visible spectrum of light, it's, uh, what's that name, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. A lot of light was oi, orange and yellow. And it turns out that's the highest uh, correlation to eye strain and eye fatigue. So if you want yellow light and orange light and you want eye fatigue, go ahead and dial that up. Today, you can actually choose and I'll ask your listeners, what's their favorite color? What's your favorite color? Uh, Mine is black. Black. Okay. Most people will say blue because blue is where your eyes are most receptive. It's 425 nanometers of light. The sky is blue. The water is blue. Um, And so most people like to have light that fills more blue into their world, blue or green. And and maybe they just like Michigan. I don't know. It's probably a a good thing. Yes. Maize and blue are my second my second favorite there colors, you go. of course. <laughs> you and now I've just I've let people into the darkness of my soul. <laughs> and then the black is my favorite color. I tapped into some of the, the true understanding of uh, of a day in the life of the editor today. But the idea, and you can see this in a lot of maybe even the GE's reveal lighting, they use blue spectrum lighting. Um, so color and color rendering index is something you can do. Um, And I think it's also ability to sort of change up. Your eyes are no different than any other body part in your, they use muscles. So you have near focus and far focus. You have uh, light and dark adapters. So, you know, just like the best posture is your next one. um, For editors, I would say that changing up and acclimating their, their eyes to both dark and to light environments as much as they can. And then near and far focus, I call it the 20-20-20 rule, that every 20 minutes, pick an object 20 feet from you and focus on it for 20 seconds and read it. And this can help those muscles that are near focus, near focus, near focus to far focus and help that wonderful balance uh, occur. So, you know, lighting opens up a huge discussion, probably an opportunity for another podcast, but it's really, uh, it's really exciting to see kind of where we are today with the options that exist. Yeah, and given the, the audience that I have, especially that I have a fair amount of colorists, that their entire life is about light and color, I would love to do an entire podcast about that. But the one thing that I will say just very, very shortly, because I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, is that the lighting that you have in your edit suite or the lighting of your computer screen can have a tremendous effect on your circadian rhythms. And I have uh, somebody that I've worked with a lot and a lot of people that have come to me and said, I just, I'll work a long day and I'll just be so frayed and wired that I can't go to sleep. And sometimes it's because of the lighting that you have around you during the day, it's messing with your circadian rhythm. So I'll put a link to a program. It's a free program that you can get online. It takes two minutes to download. It's called Flux, F-L-U-S. You just go to justgetflux.com and what it's going to do is remove your exposure to the blue light spectrum based on the time of day. So as it gets later in the day, your computer screen is going to get redder and redder and redder. And yes, if you're color correcting, it's probably not going to work for you. But outside of that, 
that's what I use to help me kind of wind down at the end of the day. And I, it works 24 seven. So when we started this podcast, um, where we started recording early about 6 a.m. Pacific time, my screen was completely red. And now it's about an hour later and the sun is coming out and now my screen is a regular color and now I feel more awake and more alert just based on the spectrum of light that I'm experiencing in my environment. Yeah, so I I think this is all uh, about trying as humans to find better hardware uh, for our human software and whether that's through the the visual, you know, 85% of the information we gather as human beings comes through our eyes. It's a really important way to shape not only how we work but how we interact. And uh, I think the the way we support our bodies, right, this this better hardware and better tools for our brains, right? And and so I think we're really at the, the crossroads, Zach, of where we might be able to see not every workstation being 100% upright, but you know what, every uh, work uh, environment might actually have an upright option. So I think there, there are a number of different uh, improvements that are happening in that world, you know, obviously moving from CISA stand or this new term stand biased or biased towards standing with a stand assist can really help evolve and, and it becomes an unfair advantage for those people that are able to tap into that, find that flow, hack that flow on a regular basis. I know for me, I feel like it's a really competitive advantage. And uh, in today's day and age, I'm looking for everyone I can get. (laughs) Yeah, I agree with that. And that's exactly why I do all the things that I do, because it does give you that competitive edge in a very, very competitive industry. So I, I definitely agree with that. So before I lose you, because I know we're getting close to our time, I have a professional ergonomist on the call with me, and I want to talk a little bit about traditional ergonomics because we have beaten the point home that there is no such thing as one great position. However, that having been said, I want people to still understand that there are certain things that they can look at if they do want to be more comfortable, if they want to have the best keyboard position, and especially with standing. People will say, well, I don't really know what's right. Like, where should my hands be? Where should my monitors be? So, With the caveat again that there is no one great position, let's talk about the best way as far as posture and ergonomics if I want to start standing up the proper workstation. Yep, so that's a really great point. So the first thing is to make sure there are a couple of points of contact are, uh, let's just say there are three points of contact, your feet and some surface that you're, you're on, your hands and some sort of input device or at least source documents maybe that you're, you're working off of, and then your eyes to uh, the content. And so, you know, we'll start with your feet. You know, one of the things that people are going to go to a standing environment, realize that rarely, if anywhere, is the earth super flat, except in an office or an editing room. You know, our bodies are designed to go over this undulating terrain. And so I make sure that what I stand on has variances in both that terrain and softness and in height. So I use a, I would say, just getting yourself a standing uh, stabilizing foot bar. Think about, you know, your local pub. <laughs> you might want to, do, do those folks want you to stay or do they want you to go? I say that, you know, the idea of putting your foot up on a foot rail, uh, five million Irishmen can't be wrong, right? They want you to stay uh, and the ability to change your position. So I start with, I'm a right-handed, uh, right-footed person. I put my foot up on my left foot up, my non-dominant foot up on a foot rail. That gives me a little bit of change in my hip flexors when I stand. So even if you don't go down the road of a stand assist, the addition of a standing foot rail or foot bar is a really nice choice. I pair that with a anti-fatigue mat that has a various softness and, and, and rebound in terms of the durometer and, and modulus that is on there. It's nice and cushy. Uh, and I frequently change my position. And so starting with the first of three points of contact, the, the foot position is really important. I use my non-dominant foot forward so that when I'm mousing, let's go to our hands, with my right hand, my shoulders end up in that hero pose. So it's although it's a Captain Morgan knee forward, my shoulders end up over the top of my hips so that I'm not unduly torquing my body out of position. I would also say that there's some value in making sure your your toes are pointed forward. Uh, imagine if you were driving a car and the wheels were cocked out wide each way, there'd be all these weird torques happening. So try and keep the toes forward and spine in line, shoulders over, uh, over the hips. 
And then we move to the, the height adjustable workstation. Let's find that maybe they've hacked their own workstation or, or they've purchased a, a new standing uh, sit-to-stand desk and they got rid of that butt clamp of a chair and now they're actually going to try standing for a while. Shake your hands out, relax, stand up in front of your workstation, put your arms at your side and relax. It's ergonomics, relax. <laughs> now raise your hands to a comfortable height where you'd like to shake hands and walk yourself forward so that your hands are just, a, your, your pinkies in, in the thumbs up position are just above the work surface. So this idea of if I can't shake hands with the work, it's unfriendly, right? So I try and match that height up. If you find it's too low, raise it up a little bit. If you find it's really high, what I call the Euro lean, and the Euro lean is basically uh, uh, about five years ago, I went over to Europe and saw these people with height adjustable desks and they cranked them to the maximum height and were just resting their forearms and elbows on it because they were tired of slouching over. They didn't have a stand assist back then. So avoiding what I'll call the Euro lean, just sort of walk up to the desk and you've got a nice comfortable position. You should have that in a comfortable handshake position, not one of these politician handshakes, way extended, but, you know, a comfortable position. So now with our second point of contact right in front of us, we've got our foot up on a foot rail. Our hands are nice in that comfortable position. Our hands are on the keyboard. We want to now understand how far our monitor should be in front of us. So there's sort of this divine proportion that you might have seen the Da Vinci Code, this whole idea that form follows function. If we place our hand forward in a fully extended position with our fist clenched, we should be able to just graze the front of the screen. It turns out our functional work reach arc is optimized just about the same level as our visual perspective range. So, you know, about 18 to 24 inches. And that top of that monitor should be at or slightly below eye level. We don't want to crane our neck backwards. So one degree of backwards neck bending, and I've seen this a lot in editing rooms, is they've got these all these huge wrap-around Thunderbolt monitors and stacked to the ceiling. Craning your neck backwards puts your neck and that spinal position under tremendous pressure. So and this is a case where when we look at monitors, we want to aim to the low side at about that functional work reach arc of 18 to 24 inches, about knuckle uh, punch distance, right? Just about the distance I could, uh, duck my face out of uh, out of the way if you were going to try and give me a, a shot to the to the nose. <laughs> if I was an Ohio State guy, you'd probably do that. But I don't want I don't want to alienate too many of my listeners. But I'm uh, I'm not going to disagree with you. There. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so those are the three points of contact, and I think the key here is don't forget 10 and two. You know, I like to do 10 and two. After 10 minutes in a specific position, I change it up. During this podcast, I've transitioned six or eight times from leaning to standing to standing in my Captain Morgan pose to the hero pose with both feet on the ground to back to leaning and and then cycling through. So, you know, it's really important that, uh, you know, we understand as this whole series and, and these new design form factors are coming forward, um, there's lots of education out there in ergonomics on how to sit correctly. There's very little in how to stand correctly. And just by placing one foot slightly in front of the other, if you don't have a foot rail with the mat, the, the little bony section on your ankle in front of your big toe, that staggered stance can take uh, three to 5% of the pressure off your back. So, you know, there's lots of little tricks and, and tips and we'd like to help um, everybody find a way to uh, to live it up, you know, to 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 evolve into uh, something that's far away from what uh, where we were headed with that uh, Wally future. Yeah, absolutely. So the last question, I can just steal a few more minutes of your time before we have to go, is. All the time, people are asking me about problems that they have with their forearms and their wrists. So what can people do if they're looking at points of contact? I know that you kind of mentioned the the handshake position. But if somebody is actually at the point where either they have carpal tunnel or they have really messed up forearms and wrists, what are some of the things that they can look at possibly messing around with? Because they're just, it's so overwhelming to put an ergonomic keyboard or ergonomic mouse uh, in Google. And you're like, I don't even know where to start. So what are some basic tips to get started there? Yep. So again, you want a natural extension of your arms away from your body. So if I can take a straight line from my elbow through my wrist, it should connect up with my middle finger. One of the things that happen is that, again, we're not to blame 
the way tools were designed, right? They, they, they typically put our thumbs down. So what's our thumbs sort of sideways or down position in our society means boo, no good. I like to make sure that I work with tools that allow a thumbs up, thumbs up mean good in my world, uh, position. So that means a mouse that actually, or an input device that allows my thumb to be in that natural handshake position. So there are various tools out there. The Avaluent makes a mouse. There's different uh, actually, Mike, uh, Microsoft came out with a new sculpt keyboard, which is pretty cool. It actually has a, a raised and tilted uh, keyboard and a, a way to use the mouse in a slightly more thumbs up for safety position. Uh, so I would just look for you know those types of devices that allow form to follow function. I'm a big advocate of also looking at the comprehend the whole system. Uh, I mentioned the neck earlier, and a lot of people exhibit uh, hand and wrist pain and elbow pain, and the real problem is in their neck. Their neck is craned backwards, all the nerves that travel through my arms, through my elbow, up through my shoulder and the brachial plexus, they connect into our central nervous system, our spinal cord, but if I impinge my neck by craning my neck backwards, that uh, it's it's just like traffic in LA. It's, uh, it's traffic at and, you know, it's, neg- it's, it's very tight tolerances in that region. So we want to make sure we start with the entire upper extremities and not forget to look at the cervical neck neck region. Um, That being said, there are lots of cool uh, devices out there that allow you to adjust your keyboard. I would say, you know, if I looked at a keyboard and the biggest issue I saw in a lot of different editing rooms, if they're using uh, an extended keyboard and not using the number pad, that little thing on the right hand side, this unnecessarily pushes the mouse away from their body and, and adds this extended reach. So, you know, getting rid of that number pad or in, in the case of the Microsoft Sculpt, it's portable, it's wireless, you can move it around where you need it and allow things right in that that prime real estate in your work area, which is, you know, right in front of you where form follows function. I would just say one last thing about standing desks. We have seen uh, people who've made the transition to standing desks uh, without a stand assist increase their hand and wrist and and shoulder discomfort. A lot of this comes from them getting tired from standing for long periods of time with no real means to change their posture. So they end up elbows on the table, leaning forward, what I call that Euro lean. And so adding a stand assist, put your shoulders back. It's much more of that, that hero pose. And in fact, our desks actually tilt slightly towards the individual, much like the old uh, architectural desks, to promote that shoulders back and, and natural uh, support for your forearm. So that having been said, actually, if I've already found one weakness in my setup because I do find that I'm reaching outside that kind of prime real estate that you mentioned where I have, I don't use a mouse, I use an Apple trackpad. And because I have the number pad on my keyboard, it's sitting outside of that. My arm is no longer perpendicular to my body. I'm probably reaching outwards five or 10 degrees. And now I know that that's something that I can optimize because it's not quite there. And I, it's funny that you mentioned the whole standing and the, the shoulder and the wrist issue because I just assumed, well, I'm having all these neck and shoulder problems because I sit all day and my posture's bad. And I started standing and I'm still to this day going to the chiropractor dealing with issues that have have to do with my neck and my shoulders. So I'm very glad you brought up the point that standing is not going to fix everything. It's it's movement and changing positions that are going to fix everything. So I'm I'm very very glad that you brought that up and for people that have issues in the wrist, forearms, neck, lower back, wherever it is, all these chronic pains, I'm gonna give a completely shameless plug. I am completing right now the course that I'm building, the online course that is going to give you all kinds of education and videos that are gonna show you how to reverse these pains that you have using specific exercises that you can do during the movement breaks that you are going to start taking throughout the day. So I'm trying to hit all this holistically from the very beginning of how do I change my position to how do I fix all these pain points? How do I reshape habits? So it's all kind of built in there. So it's just my my little shameless plug for that. 
Well, I I appreciate that, Zach. And I I will just complete this story of where I was as I watched that Wally movie to where I am today. The saving grace, just like in that movie, is that when we get up, we can free ourselves from this vicious circle. And it's never too late. You know, for me, uh, in the last two years, I've gone from 210 pounds uh, and, you know, standing and leaning burns 30 to 50 calories more per hour than does uh, sitting. Uh, I'm proud to tell you I'm 180 pounds and and I went from a 39 inch waist to a 33 inch waist and so you know it's it's pretty easy to get me a, a gift these days it's new clothes so you know I'll tell you what it's it's really nice but I just feel better about each day and and I challenge the editors out there to help people understand that there are options. There are ways that people can work differently. You have tremendous power <laughs> to shape that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I understand that. And perhaps, uh, you know, by helping yourselves, you can also help others and uh, move away from some of the some of the things like solitary confinement, working in low light. They're, they're difficult. But if we can give you a heightened sense of focus and, uh, and help you alleviate some of those pressure deadlines uh, by feeling better, then, uh, then that's a game changer. Yeah, that's exactly exactly what I'm trying to do as well. And I'm really, really glad that we connected. So this has been tremendously beneficial for my audience. I hope it's been beneficial for me. I've learned a lot and I'm going to go into my office today and start changing a few things to just make sure that I'm really optimizing the best position that I can have and make sure that I'm moving around more. So before we go, where can we send people to start learning more about what you do and the the products that your company offers? Yep. So uh, the best way is to check out Focal upright.com. You can see a lot of these things in action. Uh, they've got some great tours in places like uh, Wikipedia, Wikimedia, CrossFit, and, and you can actually take a little virtual tour of their office and see what that looks like. Um, we have a great blog series right now on, on behind the design aspects of our latest design called The Pivot, which is really cool. I'm using it right now. And uh, there's also sort of the ask the stump the chump, ask the ergo <laughs> guy, the ergo geek, Josh at focalupright.com. And you can you can leave me a message and I get a couple a day. And, you know, I love to interact. I love to help people. Uh, that's sort of my mission is to help find uh, ways to tap into that mojo, be more creative, be more productive and uh, not just live longer, but live better. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for being here. And I have a feeling that you might end up becoming a recurring podcast guest. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for listening to episode 70 of the Fitness and Post podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to access any of the resources discussed, visit our show notes at fitnessandpost.com 70. I have also created a bonus document to accompany this episode titled How to Set Up a More Ergonomic and Dynamic Workstation that outlines in more detail a lot of the concepts that Josh and I talk about in this episode. You can download your free bonus document at fitnessandpost.com 70 download. And if you would like to learn more about Focal Upright and the products they offer, visit the special link that we set up for this episode, fitnessandpost.com slash focal. That's fitnessandpost.com slash F-O-C-A-L. This episode is sponsored by editstock.com. EditStock provides high-quality, uncut film footage for those who want to learn or practice the art of video editing. This cool service offers raw footage from a variety of genres, including action, comedy, sports, and documentary, so you can pick the same kinds of projects you're looking to get hired for. You know the frustration of needing a reel to get a job and then needing a job to get a reel? EditStock solves this old chicken and egg problem by allowing you to use your cuts for your demo reel. EditStock is ideal for assistant editors trying to move up, editors transitioning to a new style or genre, and people who are brand new to editing. EditStock can even give you professional feedback on your work. Best of all, every time you buy raw footage on EditStock, 30% of the purchase goes to the filmmaker who created it. So you can help these indie directors earn back their budgets. Multi-user educational licenses are also available. Visit editstock.com to download a free sample scene and use the code FITNESS to save 10% on your order. Thank you for listening. Be well.